Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming out tonight. My name is Dom Giordano. I am a talk show host at uh, CBS Radio here in Philadelphia. And the two gentlemen that we have tonight on a most provocative topic are two guys that I've interviewed, particularly Dinesh, over the years. I'm honored to be here on an issue like this that often in talk radio, we don't talk just about politics and uh, presidential debates. We'll try to conduct it in a manner tonight that's a little bit better than some of them. But we do talk about Christianity, we do talk about religion, we do talk about science, we do talk about the intersection of all these things. So our topic tonight is Christianity Good for America with Dinesh D'Souza on my right and David Silverman on my left. Certainly is provocative. The two gentlemen that we have I want to introduce and then I'll give you a sense of how we're going to conduct it. They both are very gracious and not um, dealing in minutia meaning that if we have a lot of questions, they're going to let their uh, closing arguments uh, go, since this isn't a trial. Christianity isn't on trial tonight at all, and we'll try to take as many of your questions as we can. Dinesh D'Souza was born in Mumbai, India. He came to the United States as an exchange student, graduated Phi Beta Kappa from Dartmouth in 1983. I got to know him when uh, several books came out by Dinesh, one that I think I've interviewed him on, What's So Great About Christianity? He's also written the New York, New York Times bestseller, What's So Great About America? He's been critically acclaimed for his thoughtful patriotism. He did serve in the uh, Reagan administration. He was a policy analyst. And I think that's when the nation started to know about Dinesh D'Souza. I can tell you as a talk show host, as a communicator, he is one of the top guys I would bring on when there's going to be an elevated debate but a provocative debate, someone who's thoughtful, but interesting and entertaining at the same time. David Silverman is president of American Atheist. His claim to fame for me is he's often sparred with one of my most provocative guests, Pastor Bill Devlin, who may be here tonight, I think, coming down from Manhattan. And when I've, when I've seen uh, the pastor and David Silverman, this as good as it gets debating almost any issue involving religion, politics, and our lives. David, in his bio, says that following a traditional Jewish education, including a bar mitzvah, he attended Brandeis University, completed his bachelor's degree in computer science, while honing his debating skills with a thesis in numerous informal debates, theosist. After earning his MBA from Penn State, he married one of the Brandeis debate opponents. They currently have a 20-year mixed marriage. Uh, I know about that. Uh, I am a conservative. My wife is a Democrat. Uh, David <laughs> is a member. We all have uh, various forms of mixed marriages, and it's, it's, it's interesting how societally that has changed. Uh, he has served as a professional inventor also at Bell Labs for eight years, 74 issued patents. So the two gentlemen we have tonight have wide experience they bring to this debate and to any debate any time that um, I see them. What we're going to do is each of our debaters will have a 12-minute opening statement. I know one of them is self-timing. I'm timing and we have timers out there. So we will have the time covered very, very carefully. And then we'll have a 12-minute opening statement by the other debater. We'll have a rebuttal. And then we'll have a cross-examination, which I find to be the most riveting of all. I will try to refrain from interrupting during any of that and wait until the question period. You will have a chance during the question period for about 20 minutes, give or take or so. The debate should last about an hour and a half, and then we'll spar afterward after we hear the uh, two opponents tonight. Starting out, Mr. David Silverman, 12 minutes for his opening statement. Thank you, everybody. Let us pray. <laughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good evening, and thank you for all coming out and showing me such a wonderful welcome tonight. I would like to begin by thanking Dinesh D'Souza for inviting me to debate. Um, we all have our own opinions, and we all have our own wants and dreams, but we all have the same facts. These facts remain true no matter how much we wish they weren't so. Believe me, I want to live forever. I really do. I want my lovely wife and awesome daughter to live forever. Hi, girls. Uh, indeed, there is nobody in this room or on this planet 
that wants to live forever more than me. But that doesn't make it real. I deal in reality. And tonight, you're going to get a dose of it. You will hear no tricks from me tonight, no double talk, no verbal sleight of hand. I don't need it, and neither do you. Now, before I begin to discuss why Christianity is not good for America, I must explain what good for America means. After all, we're debating a point. We might as well be debating the same one. So I'm going to start with a basic. Good for America means beneficial to the health and welfare of America's citizens, laws, and customs. So I have 12 minutes, now 11, to tell you why Christianity is bad for all of that, and that's not nearly enough time. So I'm going to hit you with the three S's of why Christianity is bad for America. Society, science, and sex. Now that I have your attention. <laughs> Christianity asserts itself with Bronze Age morality on society, claiming that morality to be perfect and objective while never even stopping to consider the damage it is doing. Christianity cares much more for itself than it does for its people. And this is clear in the callous hypocrisy with regard to marriage equality and gay rights. I like marriage. I've been married for 20 years. I personally think it's a good thing. Stable families are good things, and children are better off in such families than they are in orphanages. Y'all with me so far? Good. Uh, however, Christianity has decided that the first half of a sentence in Leviticus warrants an entire effort to thwart marriage for a segment of the population and to leave children alone, unloved, and forgotten in the hands of the state, all in the ironic name of compassion. You see, Christianity hates to admit it's wrong, even in the face of enormous evidence and good old-fashioned kindness. Christians claim to be supporting marriage, but they get divorced more often than non-religious people, according to the Barna Group, and half of all ministers' marriages end in divorce. So Christianity has a bad divorce record and actively prevents other people from getting married, as if it were some kind of expert. That's not good. Gay rights benefit many and hurt no one. No one. But Christians oppose it out of sheer, sheer stubbornness. And since it's bad for Christians, it must be bad for everyone, so Christians assert themselves in other people's lives with their money and political power. Christianity often demands authority over non-adherence, even to the disadvantage of freedom, of religion, and honest information. Christianity pushes itself in schools with events like See You at the Polls and clandestine prayer clubs. These are aimed not at providing the opportunity for Christian kids to pray. Christian kids to pray can pray anytime and anywhere they want to. These events are scheduled and organized to recruit other people's children into their religion. They don't hide this. They're out to convert children without regard to parental wishes or even against parental wishes, all under the ironic name of freedom of religion. Christianity also asserts itself in the doctor's office, where it creates barriers for other people who wish to terminate a pregnancy. Their cafeteria-style Christian movement has determined that it's immoral to get an abortion, so they oppose it. Again, for non-inherence, by law, as much as possible. The result is a direct attack on the well-being of women's rights based solely on some interpretations of some Bible pack, pack, passages picked to support their religion. So again, Christianity decides what is moral and other people suffer. And speaking about suffering, Let's talk about how Christianity causes suffering on a broad scale by stymieing science. Christianity hates science because science keeps proving religion wrong. In all of history, science has never proven any God exists, even once. So Christianity opposes science as, as often as politically feasible. Christianity has, has decided to oppose stem cell research 
and was successful in essentially halting such research for years, once again under the banner of supposedly objective morality. So let me just take a quick pause here and ask for people to raise their hands. Please raise your hand if anyone in your family has had cancer. Keep them up. How about Lou Gehrig's disease, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease? Raise them up. Spinal injury or diabetes? Anybody? A lot of people. Your lives have been impacted negatively by Christianity because Christianity has decreed that scientific research on blastocysts would otherwise, that would otherwise have been discarded is bad. Indeed, this position has directly reduced the anticipated lifespan of every living human being by delaying the most important research in recent history. You cannot underestimate the importance and potential of stem cell research. But Christianity doesn't care. They wash their hands of the responsibility from their own actions and instead persist on stymieing research to the detriment of everyone. And they expect you to thank them. Science has proven the biblical account of creation wrong, and everyone knows it. So instead of accepting the correction and moving on, Christianity tries to infiltrate schools to silence the knowledge that we have. They say God did it is valid science and needs to be taught in schools alongside proven fact. They twist words, they pull strings, and they do whatever they can to convince people now 40% of the population, according to Gallup, that their Bible is correct and everything we know is wrong. In other words, Christianity dumbs down our society with incorrect information so they don't have to admit they're wrong. That's not good. As a result, the world laughs at us, laughs at our kids, your kids, and in many cases, you because you have a huge gap in your knowledge of science compared to the rest of the world. That's a major disadvantage, all because Christianity can't admit it's wrong. That's less knowledge for Americans, which of course leads to losing jobs when competing with better educated people from other countries. Again, Christianity doesn't care because it doesn't have to admit it's incorrect. And again, they expect you to say thank you. But it goes beyond lies. It goes beyond the callous disregard for love, children, and freedom of religion. Christianity attacks the most basic of human functions, sex. According to Christianity, sex is bad even though everyone does it. The Guttemacher Institute says 95% of Americans have premarital sex, 95%. But Christianity says these people are all doing something immoral. They promote ignorance of common use and abstinence-only education. The result? More STDs, more pregnancy, and more strife for the American people. According to the Journal of Adolescent Health, quote, we believe that abstinence-only education programs are morally problematic by withholding information and promoting questionable and inaccurate opinions. Abstinence-only programs threaten fundamental human rights to health, information, and life. Life. Does Christianity care? Will it reverse its position and aid life and health by promoting safe, responsible sex by consenting adults? No. Sex is bad. Condoms are bad. And let's not even talk about the abominable sin of masturbation. So what's the result? According to the Journal of Religion and Society at the Jesuit Crichton University in a quantifiable study across democracies, quotes, in general, the higher rates of belief correlate with high rates of homicide, juvenile and early adult mortality, STD infection rates, teen pregnancy, and abortion. No democracy, no democracy is known to have strong religiosity and high rates of social health. The most theistic, prosperous democracy, the United States, is almost always the most dysfunctional of the developed democracies, sometimes spectacularly so. 
Increasing adolescent abortion rates show a positive correlation with religion and a negative correlation with non-theism. Higher rates of non-theism also correlate with lower rates of social dysfunction. This is again statistically valid data conducted by Christians, not atheists. What about charity? Well, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development lists the charities according to percentage of earnings. Number one, Sweden. Norway is number two. Denmark is number three. Netherlands, number four. Belgium, Finland, secular democracies give far more money to charity than good old Christian America, which rates number 19. As I said earlier, we all have the same facts. You might not like these facts, and indeed you may hate them, but they remain facts. My data tonight is from different corroborating sources, most of which are religious-leaning or religious organizations themselves. They all show the same thing. Christianity fights progress, undermines civil rights in favor of its own expansion and control. It places itself above the health and welfare of women, children, teens, and families, all under the dishonest cloak of love and compassion. In closing, if someone came to you with hard data proving you were hurting people in your country, I bet you'd stop. Christianity won't. It just denies and redirects, never pausing for a minute to ponder how much damage it is doing. This is not good for America. This isn't good for anyone. Thanks, Christianity, but no thanks. David Silverman. All right, we have 12 minutes of opening statements of Mr. D'Souza. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. It's, um, it's a great privilege and great honor to be here. What a beautiful uh, setting this is, and thank you all for coming out. It's the first time I've been meeting and debating David Silverman, so I'm looking forward to a lively debate. I do want to uh, say that in one respect, we are very much on the same ground. This is a debate that is going to be conducted in the language of reason alone. Uh, at no point in this debate am I going to appeal to authority, scripture, revelation. I'm going to speak the common language of the university. Uh, and I very much welcome David Silverman's emphasis on facts. Uh, I share it. And we're going to find out in this debate who has the facts and what these facts actually mean. Now, I should say right away that his, David Silverman's opening statement, which I will specifically rebut later, is a little bit of a surprise at the outset, because even if all of it is true, it would only, it would only prove that Christianity has been bad for America in the last couple of decades. All the issues that he talks about, stem cells, abortion, uh, gays, are a very recent development in America. So even by his own admission, Christianity was really good for America, or could have been really good for America through the 1950s and 60s, but then some new issues have come up recently in which Christianity has evidently fallen short. We're going to talk more about those issues later. I actually want to get to the core of America, not peripheral issues which reasonable people, whether Christian or not, can take either side on. I want to get to what America really is, and what does Christianity have to do with that. So here we are on an Ivy League campus, and we're asking what does Christianity do for America, and my first answer is it has given us the Ivy League. Most of the Ivy League colleges were started as Christian institutions, including my own alma mater, Dartmouth. Dartmouth was founded by a Yale clergyman who went up in the woods of New Hampshire to educate and Christianize the native Indians. Sometimes I wonder how I got there. I think I might have misread the catalog. Um, 
the part about the Indians. So these colleges today have become very secular. But nevertheless, we would not have the Ivy League if it wasn't for the fervor of evangelicals who emphasize not only their religiosity but also education. Now, let's look for a moment at America. David Silverman mentioned science. Let's talk about a man of science, Thomas Jefferson, who was a man of the Enlightenment, a man of science, and not a very devout Christian. Jefferson is actually known for sitting with the Bible and a pair of scissors, and when he found passages he didn't like, he cut them out. So Jefferson was not a very devout Christian, and in a way, neither were some of the founders. Probably on the balance, the founders were Christian, but when I think about America and Christianity, it's not a debate about did the founders go to church, what did Ben Franklin really think about the uh, Trinity, it is rather, where do the core ideas of America come from? Our philosophical ideas, our economic principles, the concept of rights, of human dignity, of the value of human life, the abolition of slavery, the civil rights movement. What does Christianity have to do with those things? And my answer is, one heck of a lot. So here's Jefferson, assigned by the, f by the founders in Philadelphia to go and write a document identifying the source of rights. And this man of the Enlightenment, very familiar with Locke, very familiar with social contract, when he sits down to write where do rights come from, he can think of only one source, the Creator. The Creator is the source and the only named source of rights in the view of Jefferson. We are created equal and endowed by our Creator with inalienable rights. Focus on that word inalienable for a moment. Why are our rights inalienable. We can't give them away. We can't sell them. We can sell our labor. I could sell my shoes. Why can't I sell myself? Well, because I don't own myself. In a sense, if you look at life itself as a gift from God, we don't have the right to sell it. That's why the rights are inalienable. So my point is there is a theology embedded even in the Declaration of Independence. Now, what about the idea of separation of powers, checks and balances, minority rights? All of this comes out of the Christian idea, you could call it the low view of human nature. It was Immanuel Kant who said, out of the crooked timber of humanity, no straight thing was ever made. Now when you think about the founders, the founders came to America but they didn't come to America empty-handed. They came to America bearing on their shoulders Athens and Jerusalem. What's Athens? Classical reason. What's Jerusalem? Judaism and Christianity. Now in saying this to you, I am giving you an historical fact. Every historian who knows anything about the people who came to America knows that they came bringing with them a centuries-old tradition stretching back to Socrates and the Hebrew prophets and Christ. And those ideas embedded the country that they built. So the reason we, we have liberalism in the small sense of the term, small l, the idea that we don't trust power is because we look at human nature as sinful. And therefore, we have to divide power, a, a legislature, an executive, a judiciary. That's why we have checks and balances with people looking over each other's shoulder. Because absolute power, as Acton puts it, corrupts absolutely. What about slavery? This is probably the greatest moral crusade of American history. And the fact of the matter is that slavery was a universal institution known in every culture, in China, in India, in Africa, American Indians had slaves long before Columbus. Only in one civilization, namely the Western, did slavery become controversial. For many centuries, slavery needed no defenders because it had no critics. It was like the family taken for granted. Only in the West did a group of people, motivated exclusively by Christianity, begin to call slavery into question. The Quakers, the evangelical Christians, they began to say that if we are created equal in the eyes of God, a theological idea, 
it follows that no man has the right to rule another man without consent, a political corollary derived from that theological idea. And by the way, this notion becomes not only the basis for anti-slavery or abolition, it also becomes the basis for democracy. Why? Because democracy, representative democracy, is based on the proposition that no man, no person, has the right to rule another without consent. So we see here that the great crusades of American democracy, the great expansions of the franchise, the core meaning of what it is to be an American, the system we have, the ideas we cherish, the value of human life, it's not a universal value. The truth of the matter is that human life is very cheap in many parts of the world. Even in ancient Greece and Rome, the Spartans would put the unwanted child on the, on the hillside, happy to find it dead in the morning. Today, there are atheists like Peter Singer at Princeton, whom I've debated a few times, who advocate infanticide in the same manner. By the way, this shows us that as our culture moves away from Christianity, practices previously and historically considered barbaric are making a major comeback. But the idea of the preciousness of what we would now call the sanctity of human life, that's, that came into the West, in some ways into the world, because of Christianity. Civil rights movement. Go read Martin Luther King's letter to the Birmingham jail. Has it escaped your attention that he was the Reverend Martin Luther King? Has it escaped your attention that he quotes Aquinas and natural law? That he appeals, if you will, to eternal principles of right and wrong? In a sense, King is not pretending to be an original. What is he saying? He's saying, I have a promissory note. Well, who gave him a note? Did the Southern segregationists sign a note? No. He's appealing to the Declaration of Independence. He's appealing back to created equal. He's saying that no American practice should trump that core Christian proposition. So where would the civil rights be without Christianity? We don't know, but it might not have been at all. Finally, science. Is Christianity opposed to science? It seems that first of all, the only issue that David Silverman has here is the issue of evolution and the issue of teaching evolution in the classroom, even if he was right about that. And I have no problems with evolution at all. Even if he's right about that, he's talking about a relatively small group of Christians, probably 5% of the total, who are agitating for changing the biology curriculum. He's not talking about the mainstream of Christianity at all. If you look historically, most of the great scientists in the world for the past 200 years, going back to Galileo, Copernicus, Newton, Boyle, Faraday, Pascal, the list goes on and on, were theists and most of them specifically Christians. Even today, I would argue, science is making spectacular new discoveries that vindicate and support the idea of a creator that, if you will, give comfort to those of us who believe in a higher power. So as we look at the picture on the whole, we see an America that has in some ways gained tremendous strength. We're on top of the world. And I think some of our root principles, our free market system, our dynamism, our willingness to experiment, this has brought us up here. But on the other hand, I think it's foolish to say that everything about America is going well right now. In fact, surveys show that most people think that even if our portfolios are up over the last generation, our values are down. One reason people focus so much on these issues, prayer in schools, abortion, to me, those are symptoms. But they are pointing to a deeper dilemma, a sense of have we as a country lost our way? Is this why we are getting our butts kicked by the Chinese and the Indians and the Indonesians and the Brazilians and all these emerging markets? So we can't simply embrace the status quo without, without putting it under a moral lens. Christianity has done that in the past. It's doing that even now. And therefore, I feel comfortable in saying at the end, thank God for Christianity. Thank you very much. David Silverman with a seven-minute rebuttal.
That was 12 minutes long, and he did not give a single reason why Christianity is good for America today. Not one. Not one. What he did do is tell a few untruths. And first of all, before I get into the untruths about America, I want to say Peter Singer does not advocate infanticide. That's a gross misrepresentation that you should stop making. But one of the things that he also did was he talked about Thomas Jefferson and he talked about all the one and, and the wonderful founding fathers who brought the Christian ideals of democracy to America. He can talk about that a lot, but he can't talk about where democracy is in the Bible. It's not there. Habeas corpus, not there. Separation of powers, not there. Freedom of religion, not there. Innocence until proven guilty, not there. Rights against self-incrimination, not there. Gender equality, not there. Not in the, not in the Bible anywhere. Christians have done good things for America. There's no doubt about that. Christians can be great people, and sometimes Christianity can serve a positive purpose. There's no doubt about that. But the ignorance that they're spreading is palpable. The ignorance that they're spreading is palpable. So let's go back to what I was talking about. Is Christianity good for America today? If you make an apples-to-apples -apples comparison, you can see very easily that Christianity is bad for modern democracies. According to a Gallup 2009 poll and the World Value Survey, the HDI index, which compares quality of life, is lower in more religious countries. That's bad. Indeed, countries like Sweden, Norway, and Canada, where religion is going extinct, the populations enjoy greater happiness, less poverty, better educations, and longer lifespans today. How would this country look without Christianity's negative influence? Well, let's think about it. What would happen if every couple could marry and adopt children? Ooh. Or if women made their choices about their own bodies free from vitriol and violation of privacy? What would happen if teens were taught responsible sex practices in an ethical manner that placed safety above dogma? What if our science classes taught only cutting-edge science instead of Bronze Age religious doctrines? What if religion were no longer an excuse for bigotry? Well, the good news, we have a pretty good idea. Because we have the Gallup 2009 survey, we would look like Norway and Sweden and the other secular democracies with lower crime rates, longer lifespans, less disease, and a higher quality of life today. And that is good for America. See, no gymnastics, no double talk, no allowing Christianity for taking credit for things that individual Christians did. It has to be what Christianity is doing. If Christians learn something about science, they don't do it by looking in the Bible. They use it, they do it by doing science and math. Not by looking at the teachings of Jesus. Kepler was a Christian, but he didn't look to the Bible to see if, this, if the orbit of a planet was an ellipse. He figured it out, and that's not a Christian thing. That's a Kepler thing. Real examples that Christianity is hurting America, real data showing a rise in religion in countries like us positively correlate with a lower quality of life. That's what I'm offering you today. Real data from multiple independent sources including Christian sources, showing Christianity's positive effects on a country are fallacious. And its negative effects on societies like ours today can be devastating. Real data proving me right. Again, thank you. David Silverman. Mr. D'Souza's seven-minute rebuttal.
Peter Singer writes in one of his books that, and I'm quoting him now, my colleague Helga Cusi and I recommend that an infant for 27 days after it is born should be able to be killed for any reason. He's talking about this, a decision not by the state, but by the family, the mother, in consultation with a doctor. We're not talking about abortion. We're talking about a live kid. Now, perhaps in David Silverman's dream world, this is not infanticide. But I think most of the rest of us know what it is. Singer is for infanticide. He's also for euthanasia. And that's why a handicapped group called Not Dead Yet is constantly boycotts and appears to protest at his lectures, because they know what he's about. Let's talk for a moment about Kepler and Newton. These are guys who were not scientists who on Sunday happened to go to church. They were deeply interested in theology. Newton wrote more about Revelation, the book of Daniel, and the Bible than he did about science. He looked upon science as a way of showing God's handiwork in the world. Kepler was convinced that even though the planets didn't move in circles, they moved in a geometric pattern even more beautiful and intricate that would vindicate, if you will, God's marvelous geometric design for the world. And when Kepler found his solution, he, he composed a lengthy prayer that you can read online saying that in a sense he has, in a sense, read the mind of God. So. The point here is that we're now seeing with Silverman and others anachronism, a kind of secular projection back, a desire to, you may say, deconvert people who saw themselves as deeply devout, to erase, if you will, their Christianity. Now, it's true that the Bible doesn't talk about democracy. The Bible is actually, by the way, not a science book and it's not a political book. It does contain, however, principles. Why is it the case that slavery, which was widespread from the Roman Empire, inherited, if you will, by Europe. Why is it that slavery disappeared in Europe between the 5th century and the 12th century? No slaves in Europe by the late Middle Ages. It wasn't just the Enlightenment. Slavery was abolished in Europe and only in Europe by Christians. Why? Why is it the case that the Quakers and Evangelical Christians, Wilberforce and Britain, who led the great anti-slavery crusades, routinely quoted from the Bible? They thought they were motivated by it even if Silverman can't see what the point of it was. Historians emphasize the impact of the two great awakenings. The first great awakening in driving the moral energies of the American Revolution. The second great awakening in motivating a whole series of reform movements, the temperance movement, but also the abolition movement, the great cause of the Civil War. These are historical facts. And they're not made less facts by the fact that David Silverman doesn't know his history. Everything is new if you don't know history. Now, what about the impact of Christianity in America now? You notice that when he was talking about charity and good deeds, David Silverman somehow suddenly jumped on a plane and went to Norway. If this is a debate about America, we should talk about America. And since we want facts, I'm going to give him one. This is a lengthy study by the sociologist Arthur Brooks in a book called Who Cares? in which he divides America into four groups. Religious conservatives, religious liberals, secular conservatives, and secular liberals. And he monitors the amount of good things that people do, both in terms of giving money, but also in terms of time, over a considerable period of time. And he, he discovers that if you look at what people do for others, and if you were to rank them, the people who do the most are the religious conservatives by far. The people who do the next most are the religious liberals. The people who do, who come next on the line, are the secular conservatives. And the people in our society who do the least for their fellow man, both in terms of money and time, are the secular liberals. Now what makes this particularly ironic is that the secular liberals are economically the best off. They make the most money. They are in the strongest position to help, but in fact they do the least. Dostoevsky, by the way, knew this. He has a very interesting debate in the Brothers Karamazov where Ivan the atheist scores a devastating point against the devout Aloysia, his younger brother. And Ivan says, I can't endure the suffering of the world. Would you agree to a design of the world in which even one child's tears go unpunished and un unaccounted for? 
And Aloysia is intimidated and he goes, no, I couldn't live with that plan. So Ivan wins the argument. But as you read on, you discover that Ivan marinates in his atheist resentment. He's a point scoring guy. He wants to feel vindicated against God. What does he actually do for the suffering? Nothing. Aloysia, by contrast, spends his time with the people who are suffering. He is actually in solidarity with them. He can't meet his brother on the intellectual plane, but on the practical plane, he's far better. And the truth of the matter is that in America today, the most generous people in our society, fact, are the Christians. The people who do the least are the secular liberals who have the most and yet part with it the least. One reason Europe is an anomaly is that they have very high taxation. It's no credit to the Norwegians and Swedes that they give 4%. They have to. The state forces it upon them. So that's a different measure. That's changing, if you will, the lens and the microscope, changing the measure. If we're talking about voluntary giving, the Europeans are not that generous at all. They rely on the state to do it for them. Now, I'm going to come back and talk about issues like abortion and so on, but let me just say one thing now. The fact of the matter is, for most of my life, I've had a secular life. I only rediscovered my Christianity in the last 10 years. But I've had moral reservations about abortion since I first came to America. Why? Is it because I know that the fetus is a human being? No, I actually don't know. I agree that, that reasonable people can disagree about that. But it seems to me that precisely because that is the case, precisely because the Supreme Court itself says that there are different ways of looking at this in which reasonable people can disagree, different traditions disagree, I think we need to give life the benefit of the doubt. If I was going hunting and I saw a movement behind a bush, it could be a deer, but on the other hand, it could be, it could be a human, another hunter. Do I just draw my shotgun and shoot? No. Why? Because I might be wrong. So to me, the abortion issue is not fundamentally an issue in the Bible. The Bible doesn't say anything specifically about abortion. It's an issue of whether or not we give the benefit of the doubt to compassion, the vulnerable, and life. And I think on the balance, we should. Thank you. Mr. D'Souza. In our, in our next section, we're going to have five minutes of cross-examination. Each cross-examiner will ask questions. They will not make statements. The cross-examinee will answer questions and will not, answer, not ask any questions. David Silverman, you are up. Go to our podium? I think it's better right well, You say podiums? Yeah, we, don't, we only have the one microphone. Yeah, that's a problem. I would give the mic back and forth, but I think we'll go to separate podiums. Okay. We needed a bigger table. David, you're up. Thank you. So I, I must have fallen asleep. Um, why is Christianity better for America anyways? You've been talking about, but I haven't heard the reason. Christianity has been, Christianity has played a key role in giving us our democratic system of government. Christianity has played a key role in not only the UN Charter of Human Rights, largely written, by the way, by a devout Christian, but also in the in the principles of the Declaration and the Constitution that I'm sorry, affirm... today, today, Dinesh. Well, Why don't you think we still have that Constitution today? Yes, we do. Right. We still have the Constitution. Don't we still have the same economic okay, and political system today? Uh, he hasn't answered the question yet, folks. Let him answer the question. I think we're still living with the same philosophical, economic, and political principles that were inaugurated at the founding, don't you? And that's your idea of what's good for Christianity today? Well, I'm saying, I'm saying that Christianity has, that was my argument, it was crucial in the original architecture that has shaped our very characters, it shaped our very identities, you're a product of it also. What's more important to you, Dash, the Bible or the Constitution? Well, they're two different documents. I would say the Bible is more important as a spiritual document, but the Constitution is more important as a legal document. If they conflict, in your mind, personally, who wins? 
legally the Constitution wins. Okay. So would you agree that since there are 30,000 or so sects of Christianity, that there are lots of Christians who believe that the Bible would win if the, in a conflict? And there's nothing wrong with that either. In other words, I would appeal here to Martin Luther King's principle. The Constitution itself makes provision for dissent. If someone is a conscientious objector, let's say someone says, I don't want to go to Iraq because the Bible tells me it's wrong. And the Bible doesn't say anything about Iraq. But let's say someone thought it did. The fact of the matter is, I think it is the crudest simplification of history just to say the Constitution wins. The fact of the matter is, there is a provision for dissent in the, in the Constitution itself. Yes, absolutely. But I'm talking about loyalty. I'm talking about a group of people, a huge group of people, that are loyal to a set of laws above the law of the land. Can you tell me that you think that's good for the country? Yes, I think it's very good for the country. Let me ask you this. Is your highest law loyalty to the law of the land? If somebody told you, if we passed a law that was affirmed by the Supreme Court that said that mothers must have abortions whether they want to or not, and this was affirmed as legal by the Supreme Court, would you go along with it? No, I would oppose okay, it. Okay, so you have but a higher morality not mean, too. That does not mean I have a set of laws that I rate higher than the Constitution. Yes, it does. You do. No, you do. I'm not talking about a personal one law. I'm talking about a set of laws okay. by a preacher that a huge group of people rates more important, higher on the level than the law of the land. How can you tell me that that's good for America? I, I'm saying that you endorse the same principle. You just disagree with the morality at question. I can give you a number of other examples in which you would agree that there are moral principles that you subscribe to that if the law was different, you would nevertheless disobey that law. I'm talking about a separate set of laws that I hold higher than the law of the land. And you're denying that, that you subscribe to a higher set of moral principles that if the law of the land contravened them, you would go with the law of the land. No, I would dissent, but it doesn't mean I have a loyalty to someone else. You just haven't else. assembled those things into a set. No, I'm saying I don't have a loyalty to someone else, and you do. And that's not good for it, America. It's not... <laughs> Let me go on, I'm running out of time. Well, I, I just the, have a the only difference is that you have the same absolute morality, which you don't trace to a creator. You're saying that for some reason, because I think that this same moral law has a moral lawgiver, and you don't, your moral laws are okay, but mine aren't. No, I don't have an I absolute moral law. I think that's what you're saying. <laughs> David, you have about a minute left if you have one more question. I got one more question. Do you agree that condoms present, prevent pregnancy and the spread of disease? I I'm sorry, can you Do you again? agree that condoms prevent the spread of disease? Yeah, they can, absolutely. Is it better to have sex with a condom or without? Well, from the point of view of preventing disease, of course it is. Okay. So... <laughs> but on the other yet, hand, yet, to me, the greatest motive but, of having sex is not disease prevention. Yet you... I can think of other benefits. But given the fact that 95% of the country is having premarital sex, you oppose condoms and you equate it, you mention it as immoral as abortion or any of the other things that you pick to be immoral. How do you, how do you justify that with morality? Well, David, you said at the beginning of this debate that you're going to focus on facts. Yes. So can you quote a section from my writings now or in the past where I quote oppose condoms? Yeah. When? Uh, you, you've opposed condoms in a lot of your debates. I have? Yeah. I never ha Oh, are you saying that you don't oppose condoms and you don't view them as immoral? Look, I believe that within a committed marriage you don't need condoms. I'm talking about premarital I sex I'm to not, condoms. That's not, not an answer to my question. I are have, you saying that condoms are moral? I have never spoken against the legality of condoms. That's not what I asked either. Are you saying that condoms, and I'm not asking about legality at all, are you saying that condoms are moral or immoral? I think that that's a bogus question because legality... <sighs> Let me tell you why. The issue of legality is what applies to other people. That's like asking me whether or not I like horror films. I may not like horror films, but I have nothing against horror films being legal, so anybody else is welcome to go to horror films. So why should my taste in horror films be used as a prohibition on society as a whole? I've never spoken against condoms. All right, thank you. We need a fact checker on that one, I think. We'll continue I think so. with uh, Mr. D'Souza now. We'll cross-examine David Silverman. Do you think, can you think of any 
secular reason to be against abortion. Yes. So you think it's quite possible for somebody to be against abortion even if they're an atheist? Yes. And in fact, there are atheist groups who are against abortion? Yes. So opposition to abortion by itself is not a religious position? By itself, no. Yes. And therefore, all the stuff that you said about the Christian role in abortions, the Christians could just say, we have very good reason for opposing abortion that Jews and Hindus and Muslims and even atheists can agree with. Just because we're Christians and we oppose abortion doesn't mean that this is a purely theological view. It could very well be a moral or political view, right? That's not the position that they take, but it could be a, the it could be a moral view. And since you don't know what's in their minds and what is their real motive inside their heads, isn't it possible that the arguments that they give for abortion, such as it is the killing of unborn human life, should be taken at face value? The principal reason that they oppose abortion is because somebody has decreed that a, that a zygote is a conscious, sentient life with the soul. That's not right. That's imposing your religious views on other people. If they took the view that abortion, if they took the secular view, it wouldn't be such a problem in my mind. In my mind. So you're saying that if I think that a zygote uh, a blastocyst is a, has a right to life. Let's say I don't even think it's a human life, it's a potential human life. A I don't living think that blastocyst. potential human life should be snuffed out. You're saying that because the Pope or some other religious authority issues a similar position, therefore my position is invalidated, it becomes a religious position, it doesn't belong in the public square even if I can give moral reasons to support it. No, that's not what I said. Well, what are you saying? I'm saying that if you uh, use your political power as a religion because of your religious views to force it on other people, that's unethical as far as the, as far as the American pro uh, policy is concerned. Let's probe that for a moment. Mm -hmm. Are you saying that, let's say for example that 60 percent of the people in America are devoutly religious and because of their religion, whether they're Jewish, Christian, Hindu, or whatever, they have certain political views, right? Yeah. And they want to advance those views in a democratic society in which believers and non-believers both share the public square. Are you saying that all people whose views have a religious origin should automatically be disqualified from bringing those views to the public square so that the public square is then a monopoly of secular atheists? No, I'm saying, I'm saying religion should not be allowed to use its views and push its views as an organization, as in fact a separate country, onto our American society. And why? Now let's ask why that is. Because you would agree that if somebody was a Republican or a Democrat or a Libertarian or the National Rifle Association uh, or an atheist, that they should be perfectly free as they do as should Christians. Pardon? As should Christians. But I thought you just said... I'm talking about Christianity. I'm talking about organized religion pushing itself on people who are not adherents. That's right. the problem. So you have no problem in other organizations. I mean, you talk about organized Christianity. Isn't the National Rifle Association an organized group? It's not a religion. Last time I checked. Uh, yes. Okay, so let's explore that. So if you're promoting guns and the right to buy an Uzi, you can organize all you want. You can put all the money you want into campaigns. You can hire all the lobbyists you want. But if you are the Presbyterian Church and you want to start a hospital or put up a statue to, let's say, Paul in the public square, you can't do that because you're organized religion. Why is that? If we have freedom of religion in this country, that means one religion doesn't get to assert itself on the population at large. This is a very simple question. That's a non sequitur. No, it's not yes, a non sequitur. It it's completely logical. You're confusing two principles. First of all, if we have other organizations involved in politics, do we have a national establishment of the NRA? No. The NRA can participate in politics and it doesn't violate any no establishment clause. Every other organization can participate in politics and it's not seen to jeopardize the existence of the state or as an official state endorsement. The government gives money to farmers. Is the United States establishing farming as a national occupation? No. You're, you're looking I'm at me, I, I don't, don't know if you're being I really don't. cunning or obtuse, but what I'm trying to say is the fact that the government subsidizes something doesn't make it an establishment. If the farmers can get but money... But we have a federal law against the establishment of a religion. 
That's the whole point. But, we, but, but an abortion is doing that. That's what exactly what Christianity is. When Christianity comes on and asserts itself and says, we are going to use our money and power to establish our religion, the religion of anti-abortionism, against non-adherence, no, that's illegal, that's David, bad for America. Anti-abortionism is not a religion. It's a point of view. It's a position on a moral issue. All right, Fine. that concludes our cross-examination by Mr. D'Souza. We'll have a five-minute rebuttal by David Silmerman and then Mr. D'Souza, and then we'll be ready for questions. David, you okay. have five minutes. So I have five minutes, and then he has five minutes, and then we're done. Is that right, or we have three uh, Questions from the audience and closing okay, statements. Well, that's, yes, okay. exactly. Um, Dinesh, you've been known to say you don't like cafeteria Christianity, that your Christianity is contextual and not cafeteria. Is that correct? No, this is your this is your time to rebut, not, rebuttal, not question not, me. No more it's, you're just giving a five-minute oh, speech. I'm sorry. Yes. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm a little confused because I thought we were supposed to go back and forth. Hold I like the, the questions, but I am only the titular moderator here. I'm looking for a signal. We can go with more questions. Both gentlemen agree with more questions. You want to do? I'll, I'll I like agree. The questions. Oh, I, I'm sorry. All right. <laughs> questions. Fire away. Why don't you you question me for five, and I'll question you for five. There you go. All I right, think okay. that's a good idea. Okay. So your religion is contextual and not cafeteria. Right. That your, that's your words, right? That's my I'm words. I'm getting that quote right, right? Aren't these both examples of you interpreting passages as you see fit? There's no contradiction. There's no contradiction between looking for a contextual Christianity and using your own interpretation any more than if I were to take the position that we can't read Hamlet except in context. You can't quote isolated passages, but that doesn't mean I don't have my own interpretation of Hamlet. I do. But you do talk about an absolute morality that comes from the Bible, do you not? Uh, the absolute morality does not come from the Bible. The absolute morality comes from conscience. Comes from conscience, so yes. everybody has a different conscience. Everybody has not a different con. everybody has a different set of neural networks in their brains, but the moral law that conscience appeals to is shared by all normal human beings. But we all differ on what morality is. No, we don't. We differ on the application of it. How so? Well, let's give you an example. If there was a small dog on the stage here, and then our a worthy moderator got up and began to stomp on the dog, I think a wave of revulsion would spread throughout the audience, showing that there's a shared moral response to a simple event. Now, admittedly, if it was a cat, we might go different ways. <laughs> but that doesn't come from Christianity. That doesn't come from God. That comes from us. David. I did, I, when I opened the Bible and I read the Ten Commandments, I did not go, wow, stealing is wrong. Wow, murder is wrong. What a discovery. I already knew that. <laughs> so the Bible is a ratification of conscience, not a substitute for it. The Bible is a ratification of conscience, not a the substitute for it. The Ten Commandments are a codification of already existing moral codes. It didn't invent those codes. Okay, but it does specify the penalties for breaking those codes. Are those part of our absolute morality? Uh, no, because the penalty specified in the Bible applies to the old Jewish law and was abrogated, at least to some degree, in the New Testament or Christianity. So there are parts of the Old Testament, then, that we really don't have to pay attention to at all. Exactly. Okay, great. I wanted to make sure about that. So. How do we I mean, know? that's not my position. That was the position of Paul. There was a huge debate about this by the early Christians. And so that's why, for example, Christians don't keep the Sabbath. They don't have bar mitzvahs. They don't do a lot of stuff that Orthodox Jews do. This issue was settled 2,000 years ago, even if you're just finding out about it now. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for the snark. Um, whose Christianity is right, and how do we know? We're talking about, is Christianity good for America? Whose Christianity is right, and how do we know? Well, the fact of the matter is that while you can say there are a lot of different sects and so on, there is a kind of mainstream Orthodox Christianity that's come down for 2,000 years. It is the common ground between the Protestants and the Catholics. You can call it Nicene Creed Christianity, and it's the, it is the Christian mainstream. Now, on the periphery, there are lots of debates about pre-millennials and post-millennials and something that is sometimes debated called the rapture and so on. But the fact of the matter is the mainstream Christian tradition is subscribed to by the vast majority of self-identifying Christians. Well, oh, but there are 30,000, 30, 33,000 different sects of Christianity. Every single one of them believes they're right. 
how do we know which one is right for America? Well, in a, in a country where you have freedom of religion, you don't. That would, but that would be like me saying there are 40,000 types of conservatives and Republicans, and there probably are, but nevertheless, there is a conservative point of view that most of us would recognize. But the breadth of Christianity is huge. 30,000 different sects, that's a lot of breadth. 33,000 actually, and 31,000 sentences in the Bible. 33,000 sects of Christianity, that's a pretty broad amount of disagreement. How do we know what kind of Christianity is right for America? David, we're, we're, I think we're here a little bit in different planets. I mean, if you go into a Christian church, whether it be, I'm not talking now, for example, about the guys in Waco who are uh, the, 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 the church that shows up at military funerals, but if you go to Presbyterian churches and Methodist churches and Anglican churches, you hear the same Christianity, different liturgy, different emphasis. It's completely recognizable. You mentioned that you, your mixed marriage. I was raised Catholic. I'm married to an evangelical Christian. I've been in a lot of different churches. I speak in a lot of different churches. They're very different in a way. Some play modern music. Some play um, uh, some classical hymns. But the fact of the matter is the core elements of the Christianity are recognizably the same. So, Mr. Mr. D'Souza, your turn to start with uh, questions for David Silver. You mentioned at the outset of your talk that you were going to have a talk based on facts. Mm -hmm. And then you immediately followed it by saying, I would like to live forever. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you a question. Will you live after you die? No. Now, that's an interesting statement because if Shakespeare is right, death is the undiscovered country from whose born, as he puts it, no traveler ever returned. None of us, neither you nor I nor Dom, have been through the door of death, nor I assume have we interviewed dead guys. You don't know what comes after death, do you? Shakespeare writes fiction, right? He wrote fiction. Uh, Dinesh, and, and, the and line we I'm have a set of laws is of physics. A profound now, listen, statement about human nature and about what we really know. Your, your question Someone was... Someone can be a fiction writer and still make truthful statements about human nature. Have, have you ever read Shakespeare? Yeah, I have. Okay. Yeah. You just I've dismiss read, it all I've read as a fiction. little Shakespeare. My, my point is that you asked me uh, how I know there is no life after death. I didn't ask you that. I asked you a straight out question. Do you know that there is no life after death? As well as I know everything, I know there's lo no life after death. Okay. Everything dies, no matter how much we wish it weren't true. Kitties die, doggies die, fish die, plants die. Every living thing in the universe dies. That's right. And, 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 and caterpillars die, but they also become butterflies. I'm sure if you That's ask a caterpillar... Death, my friend. I'm sure if you ask a caterpillar what comes after caterpillardom, they would say nothing. But the fact of the matter is, the fact of the matter is, you don't know what comes after that, do you? You're doing Russell's teapot, Dinesh, and Ru you know better Russell's than this. Russell's teapot? This... Russell's I'm, teapot. I've heard of Russell's teapot and the spaghetti monster, but, but those are fallacious arguments. I'm Russell's teapot you, is not a fallacious argument. Is. That's it's exactly a, what you're doing. It's a you're completely... saying, well, I don't know that there's not some way, some reason out there, so I'm going to believe it. If there's no reason to believe something, you don't believe it. You Let don't me... believe that there's something orbiting Pluto without reason. There's no reason at all to believe in life after death. Let 2,000 me... years, Christians have been trying to show. David. Actually, 5,000 years, people have been trying to show life after death. Every single one of them has failed 100% of the time. How much data do you need? There, you've supplied no data. Look, let me ask you this. Let's, let's test your proposition that if something, if we do not have evidence for something, therefore it does not exist. Is that your principle? If we do not have evidence for something, there is no reason to believe it exists. Right. Let me ask you this. It's a difference. Do you, cons do you think that there is a possibility of life on other planets? Yes. And yet we have no evidence for life on other planets, do we? Life on other planets would not violate yeah, every yes known... Yes no if you can. Is what? there evidence for life on other planets? There's no evidence against right. and yet it. You, and there and wasn't... Yet Yes, and yet, let me answer the question, and yet, sir. Let me answer the question, sir. Okay. Life on other planets would not break every law of physics as we know it. God and an afterlife would. I don't think it would. First of all... No, there's a one thing between the laws... postulating different things, and there's another thing between postulating 
fantasy. Okay, there's agree, no Santa Claus. I David, can't prove Santa Claus doesn't exist. But I don't actually give it credence, Dinesh. We're not talking about Santa Claus. Yes, do you, we are. Do you agree? Do you agree? Do you agree that the laws of physics are, if you will, a set of laws that apply to our universe? A set of understood laws that yes. apply to the universe as we know it. And if there were other universes or other realms beyond our universe, they would have other laws, wouldn't they? Possibly. And that's what cosmologists say right now, don't they? Some. Right. And so if there is another realm called heaven and another realm called hell, wouldn't it stand to reason that they would have different laws than the ones that we have on earth right now? Are you postulating that God is some sort of interdimensional space alien? I'm saying that's a possibility. Oh. Well, if you're saying that God is a space alien, that takes it into I a different account. I didn't say he was a space alien. Uh, that's what you just said. We were talking about life after death. Uh, you I just said, said different universes, and yes. that means that different universes apply to different laws, mm -hmm. and there could be life in those different universes, I suppose, but then anything in that universe would be subject to the laws of that universe, and that's not supernatural. That is just beyond the laws of nature at we, that we know today. Actually, that is supernatural because nature describes our universe. No, nature is all there that is. That is not supernatural. Supernatural is outside the laws of nature. That's right. Not outside, outside the, laws the laws of nature, of nature. as we know it. Outside Big the laws difference. of nature as we know them. Thank you very much, gentlemen. That concludes our uh, moving off of the schema here and going Whew. to questions back and forth, which I particularly enjoyed. All right, we have time just for closing statements. David, if you'd like to go first. I'm sorry. Well, I, I'd like to just make a statement here about the World Trade Center cross. 9-11 uh, was an American tragedy, not a Christian one, okay? It had absolutely no more to do with Christianity than it had to do with atheism. And what they're doing by putting in a cross is they're allowing the Christians to be memorialized, and they're ignoring the four to 500 atheists that died on 9-11. That will not stand. We're not going to sit back and let public money on public land be going out to one, re one religion, not just on the establishment cause, but also on the equal protection clause. It is uh, anti-American to say that. We're not demanding removal of the cross. We're demanding the removal of the cross or the equal treatment of everybody else, and that is purely American. Now, and by the way, we're going to win. Uh, the objective tonight was to whether, was whether or not Christianity is good for America. By the way, before I go on, uh, I just want to put out a, uh, a thank you to everybody for coming. I also want to mention that the Reason Rally will be the largest secular event in world history. Fifteen national organizations will create a bunch, uh, uh, essentially a, an atheist Woodstock on March 24th, and you're all invited to come, reasonrally.org. Now, I brought quantitative data tonight. I brought quantitative data defending my assertion that Christianity today is not good for America today. Real statistically significant data from multiple corroborating independent sources showing a po positive correlation between Christianity and that which we consider to be bad for America a rise in disease, a rise in ignorance, a shorter lifespan, less charitable giving, and a lower quality of life. That's bad. I have shown that the secular democracies, countries like us, don't have the problems that we have, at least not to our extent, and I have shown that here in America, Christianity asserts itself on non-adherence with cafeteria-style morality that it determines is morally objective. The problem is that their objective morality is subjectively selected, and therein lies the reason for the many different sects of Christianity. Has my opponent made his case? Did he use enough research to support his claims to countermine? Did he use logic? Did he use hyperbole? Did he use quantitative data? Or did he use straw man arguments? Facts are facts, ladies and gentlemen. And whether you like them or not, they remain facts. The fact that you've been raised to believe a myth doesn't make it true. Not knowing the answer to a question doesn't make something else true. Ignorance of fact is not 
evidence for fiction, and wishing doesn't make it real. Every living thing in the universe dies. It really dies. It doesn't go anywhere, and like I said before, neither do your dogs or your cats or your kids or your grandparents. We all want to live forever. And this is why so many intelligent people believe the lies spread about religion. We submit to religion's authority. We buy their books. We tell their stories. And we tithe our paychecks, sometimes way too much, just so we can pretend to believe in an eternal life. None of that makes it real. Is it a nice lie? Certainly. Does it make people feel better? Oh, yeah. Does it make people violent or vitriolic or vindictive when the lie is challenged? Most definitely. Does any of this make the lie truth? No. Ladies and gentlemen, I dare and beg you all to research your religion carefully. Don't live your life according to a lie just because your parents raised you to do so. You have one life. Live it well. Look at both sides and think about it in depth for a long period of time. Because Christianity is not only bad for America, it's bad. Thank you. David Silverman. <laughs> Mr. D'Souza's closing statement. Probably my first exposure to Christianity that I remember was as a young boy I was talking to my grandfather about how our ancestors became Christians. And I said that I had read about the Inquisition and the European countries coming to India. And my grandfather pointed out something that had never occurred to me. He said, in fact, lots of Indians flung themselves into the arms of the missionaries. Why? Because in India you had the caste system. And if in the caste system you were at the bottom of the ladder, you were doomed. No amount of merit, no amount of effort could get you out of it forever or your descendants. So when the missionaries came, they might have been selfish, ignorant, greedy, etc. But they were talking about universal brotherhood. We are all equal in the eyes of God. And this was a revolutionary idea. And so many of the low caste Hindus instantly became Christians. This is the nuance and complexity of history. And it's something that has been missing on the other side of this debate. Now, the facts that David Silverman talks about are nothing more than a kind of recycled handful of surveys showing correlations which are not causation. If I were to say that India has been a poor country for 2,000 years, that wouldn't show that Hinduism is stupid. It would just show that I've picked a poor country where the people are Hindu. India is actually doing very well now. Hinduism doesn't suddenly get smart. Circumstances changed. In America, it's true that the southern part of America is more Christian. It's also more conservative. It's also more poor. It's a society that historically was a plantation society, hierarchical, feudal. The immigrants came in the north. There are innumerable reasons for the sociological facts. Never once did David show the slightest indication of any awareness that there are even other variables involved. Never once did he try to sort out the difference between correlation and causation. I cited facts, including a study, Who Cares, by Arthur Brooks. He didn't even seem aware of it. He certainly didn't rebut it. The idea that the secular atheists and liberals are the most selfish, least giving people in America has gone unrebutted in this whole debate. So what are we really left with? We are really left with atheist dogmatism. And the issue of life after death brings that into dramatic clarification. The fact is, death is an impassable barrier. What comes after death, I don't know, and he doesn't either. The real difference between him and me is not that he knows and I don't. It is that I would admit that my position on life after death, that there is life after death, is based on faith. David Silverman's position that there's no life after death is also based on faith. 
but poor atheist he has deluded himself into thinking that it's based on evidence even though he has no evidence the fact that he is not even open he thinks that belief in life after death is a wishful illusion a very nice thing the truth of it is I'm scared of life after death to me it's not a very nice thing why there's the possibility of heaven but there's also the possibility of hell Fra Freud's idea that we all make up the afterlife to give us a better life than the one we have now cannot explain the theological doctrine of hell which is much worse than anything we have in this life so the idea that the Christians made it all up isn't just going to fly that easily and here's a final point there is a whole body of data on who are the happiest people in the world this data which is called the happiness research if you will it's associated with people like Dan Gilbert at Harvard Jonathan Haidt at the University of Virginia shows that people who pray who have a sense of the afterlife and transcendence who are monogamous in marriage who live by what can be called traditional Christian morality are the happiest people in the world why it's because Christianity supplies something that atheism can't even Marx knew that when Marx said Christianity is the is religion is the opium of the masses he knew that it offers hope and consolation at the point of death that atheism can't give you if you read Steven Weinberg Richard Dawkins you find despairing credos of the fact that the universe is pointless Bertrand Russell said we can only build a philosophy of atheism on unyielding despair if that's what you're looking for be my guest but what Christianity offers you is the experience of the sublime a sense that your life is part of a cosmic drama a sense that you can hope for an existence beyond death reunited with your relatives a sense of transcendent morality that we all know is within us a sense that a way to teach morality to our children we can talk about morality coming from Kant and Schopenhauer but nobody ever taught their kids morality that way they taught a morality through Hinduism and Buddhism and Christianity so even in a secular way Christianity supplies hope morality cohesiveness a sense of optimism about life and that experience of the sublime one reason David talks so much about sex is that in our secular society sex gives us that momentary glimpse of the sublime but then it's gone with religion with the belief in God you can have that same sense of the sublime all the time every day and Christianity supplies that not just to America but also to the world thank you very much thanks to David Silverman Dinesh D'Souza thank you all tonight for being here thank you very much